good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for joining this Northern Cancer Alliance Bite Size Learning event. So we've got some opportunity this afternoon to um, to uh, think about teledermatology and um, how it's being used now across the region and the opportunities for teledermatology in the future. So for the first part of the session, I'm going to hand over to um, Dan and Manisha from CDDFT. Um, Manisha is the, um, the lead consultant for dermatology and Dan's the service manager and they've been um, very involved in developing the teledermatology pathway for, um, for Durham. So I'll hand over to them now. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Uh, so as I say, my name is Dan, I'm the service manager. Uh, just going to run through our uh, rationale for change and where we were in terms of uh, the service and just a bit of a background so we can explain why we uh, chose to go down the route with teledermatology. So uh, next slide, please. Geographically, we have uh, a very large catchment area running up from Jarrow and South Shields in the northeast to the border between Darlington, Stockton, North Yorkshire in the southeast. Uh, the now infamous Barnard Castle in the southwest and up to the, the North Pennines and Concert in, in the northwest. Um, we also get cross-border patients coming through, for, which is a, a minority, but a significant minority coming through from North Yorkshire, Cumbria and the Newcastle Gateshead region as well. Uh, so as, as the lead provider, we, uh, sorry, next slide please. Uh, as, as the lead provider, we have uh, four large hospitals within our catchment, uh, the University Hospital of North Durham, Darlington Memorial, Bishop Auckland General and the Sunderland Royal Hospital, as well as also providing uh, community services in GP, uh, GPSI led services, all of which provide, uh, used to provide skin cancer outpatient appointments and also minor surgery for, for the treatment of cancer. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, again, to, to look at that, that, that population is approaching around a million people uh, across those different areas. Uh, look, I've done some analysis looking at our population. That, that the, the, the bar chart there shows our population spread by the age groups as uh, the, the mid-June estimate last year, and also the, the, the rate of melanoma um, by the different age groups. And you'll see that uh, it'll come as no surprise that this is something that increases with age. Um, we have, a very high proportion of patients within that higher age bracket, uh, which I'll explain a little further uh, in the next slide, please. So just we com I compared our catchment to the whole of the northeast and to the national picture uh, and put them into, into three primary cohorts, paediatrics and adolescents, uh, people of a working age and, and older slash overworking age populations. The, the, the working age population is similar um, in the in, in our catchment compared to the northeast and the national picture, but where it diverges is within the paediatric and the older populations. Our paediatric population is around 6% lower than the regional average and 8% lower than the national average. And our older population, the, the higher risk population for skin cancers, was 6% uh, higher than average in the region and 11% above average in, for, against the national picture. So the reason why uh, to highlight those is um, if you just look at pure headcount of people in the area, we do carry far more risk of having patients presenting with skin cancers uh, within our services. Just uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> looking at our data, we were, we have an average had an average uh, in a 16 month period of around 145 referrals per week coming through from our GPs uh, through the TCGs. This, uh, as again, comes come as no surprise that we have a summer peak running from July through to the end of September and into early to mid-October, typically around 25% higher than the rest of the year. Uh, the variation weekly is reasonable beyond that. Uh, and as you'll know, with the, the two week weight cancer standard in there, this can make it very difficult to prepare when you have surges and uh, troughs in demand that are to some extent unpredictable. So recognising that we also had a background of approximately 2% annual growth, we had a lack of surgical appointments and with around two in 10 patients presenting to clinic requiring surgery. Uh, with eight out of 10 patients not necessarily going on for surgery and being discharged uh, uh, following their attendance, the hypothesis we were pursuing was, was there a better way of doing at it? And we thought that tele triage may be the way to assess that. We examined what Leeds had been doing. Um, they, they'd had a, a working tele triage model uh, that it took them, as I understand it, around three years to embed that and get that up and running. 
we have been able to do our successfully within uh, six months. Uh, next slide, please. So just to consider the constitutional standards, I've just picked out the two um, for the two week rates and the 62 day performance I've picked. Uh, skin is uh, within CDDFT the, by far the biggest uh, individual uh, tumour site cancer that, that we are, are tracking. So uh, I've put in there my, my little line at the bottom there, cancer around a third to maybe up to 40% of cancers. So for skin cancer to fail is not an option because we drive the trust performance. Those charts there showing the, uh, the skin performance in the blue and the trust performance in the red, you'll see that we routinely outstrip the rest of the organisation, meaning that, as I say, our role as flag bearer for that cancer standard, we, we need to, to be achieving those standards. I'm going to hand over to uh, Manisha for the next section. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, right, so what I'm going to go through is how we did it. We'll go through the SOP um, of for teletriage, uh, which has been accepted and what we are practicing in our trust. Uh, and then we'll go through some of the clinician experiences and then Dan would give an idea about the performance and then back to me to discuss future options for teledermatology. Um, so we started based on this demand of 145. Worst case scenario is to even get up to 200 referrals per week, uh, of which only 10% uh, in reality needed surgery. Um, so based on the fact uh, uh, based on this fact, we decided that we needed a model where you could triage the referrals before they came, um, and which is why we developed the tele-triage model. Um, there was the option of initially going uh, small, which is what most units have done in the past in the country, uh, where they have engaged with a few uh, GP practices who were keen uh, and pro proved that it worked for those GP practices and then extended it to other GP practices, but that would have taken us far too long uh, to embed the model um, and we were in a hurry simply because we were unable to meet the demand that was coming or uh, that uh, towards us. So we decided to go all out, which meant that all the GP practices would engage simultaneously. Um, and that was a big ask. Uh, so we had to initially speak to all the stakeholders. This included the five CCGs, then five, now four uh, that we dealt with. Um, we had to deal, uh, we had to have meetings meetings with the cancer network uh, as well as in the trust and meetings with secondary care colleagues who are actually going to provide for this service. Uh, and I'm happy to say that there was very good engagement from all sides. And I think one of the big enablers was the network allowing us to um, consider a virtual appointment as a clinic appointment, which would allow the clock to stop. Uh, therefore, the patient could be, be safely discharged based on a photo. Uh, and there are many trusts across the country where the network hasn't agreed to this basic rule. Uh, so teletriage simply cannot be implemented if the network doesn't agree to a two week wait appointment uh, being a virtual appointment. Um, whereas we were lucky in that aspect. Uh, so many trusts haven't been able to take it on board because their local network did not agree uh, uh, to this model where uh, a virtual appointment was considered as a clinic appointment. So very thankful to the network for this. Um, next slide, please. So we are thankful to the various CCGs for the investment that they put in this project and for their belief that the project would work. Now, speaking to other um, trusts across the country, uh, they have shown a 16% reduction in the number of two week wait referrals uh, through teletriage, and that is the average. Uh, we were aiming for a 30% reduction in the two week wait referral, so it was a big ask, and only a 30% reduction or more would have allowed to have an economic impact for all the investment that was put in by the CCGs and for the trust to change everybody's job plans to give clinicians time uh, in order to do the teletriage work. So our aim was a bit higher than the 16% that was projected in the national figures. And I'm happy to say that we have achieved that uh, figure ourselves. The CCGs invested heavily in the equipment that was provided to all the GP practices. This included iPhone 10s, a license for Consultant Connect, which is an app where they download the pictures safely uh, on cloud and so that the pictures that the patients um, have are not getting saved on somebody's desktop or in my photos. Uh, so to make it uh, to, to comply with data protection, this app had to be used. 
and then there was heavy investment into dermoscopes because we wanted a, a 30 percent reduction in the number of two week weight referrals we were seeing and that can be done if the images have had dermoscopic images enclosed along uh, with the close up images um, and for this the ccgs had to invest in dermoscope uh, thereafter we did road shows which involved our medical photographer, the managers, uh, CCG leads, as well as myself going to all these five roadshows across five uh, geographic areas that we covered. We had very good attendance at the roadshows where representatives from individual GP practices attended um, and they were shown how to use the equipment. The photographer went through uh, training as to how to take a good quality photograph. There were videos provided to every GP practice. Uh, as well as a SOP to every practice as to how to take a good photograph. And then the rollout happened in uh, initially May 2019. Uh, for first three months, there was a reprieve that if a GP practice could not send the photos, we still accepted the referral. But after three months, if a referral came without a photo, it was returned back. Uh, and we did get a very good engagement and were pleasantly surprised with that. Um, next slide. That's the standard operating procedure slide, please. Right. So this is the standard operating procedure that we followed. Uh, so you can see in the uh, right hand column uh, there is a referral incomplete, which means that you don't have adequate data or the referral has, has come without photographs. Uh, and in such instances, uh, we write back to the GP surgery uh, to say that please enclose a photograph and uh, the clinic admin team would also gently remind the GP surgery. If in 24 to 48 hours there is no image forthcoming, then we have to accept the referral as a two week wait referral so a patient does not get disadvantaged. Uh, this middle column you can see is if a photograph is inadequate, which means the quality of the photograph isn't great. Uh, in that case, again, the SOP involved accepting this uh, patient as a two week wait appointment so as not to disadvantage the patient. We then had suspected cancers where if you saw a lesion on the photograph that was suspicious of being an invasive skin cancer, then you had the opportunity to either put that patient into a two week wait appointment in clinic in dermatology or if the lesion was big and needed plastic surgery input, the patient could then be transferred into a plastic surgery two week wait appointment and that has been the game changer. Uh, as well, because previously if you had patients who came with large lesions, they then got referred to plastic surgery that to wait another two weeks to be seen by plastics and thereafter have surgery. So that put an unnecessary delay in the patient pathway. Whereas now if we can redirect patients at source on ERS into a plastic surgery clinic, then it's a win win for everybody. Uh, the next option was also to refer into maxillofacial surgery department at Sunderland uh, because we have close links with them and they used to see a lot of our skin cancer referrals from dermatology to MaxFax at Sunderland. Uh, so we had the option of referring to maxillofacial surgeons at Sunderland as well. Uh, and then the last two columns are the non cancers. So if you had patients who presented with low grade skin cancers that do not require a two week wait appointment or a lesion that you feel needs to be seen in clinic, but not necessarily as a two week wait appointment, then you could downgrade the referral to routine appointment for either dermatology or plastic surgery. Um, and finally, if a patient had a lesion that was benign uh, and didn't need any input in the secondary care, we just write back to the GPs discharging the patient and giving advice on treatment in primary care. Um, next slide, please. So initially uh, when we rolled it out, the biggest challenge for us was getting photographs with every referral. So number two was getting good quality photographs um, and that continued to remain a challenge for a few months, but we were confident that once a GP practices got better at doing it, then eventually uh, this problem would be ironed out uh, and we have seen an improvement over a period of time. Although there was a blip during COVID, which is understandably so that patients could not access their GP surgeries, therefore the quality of images wasn't great. Um, the second challenge we faced was initially this SOP and teledermatology was developed only for dermatology to week weight referrals, um, whereas plastic surgery continued to get referrals directly without images. 
and we suddenly saw a drop in the number of dermatology appointments and a, a, a corresponding rise in the plastic surgery appointments that they couldn't then cope with the demand that was placed on plastic surgery. So eventually we developed an SOP for a single skin cancer pathway for the trust. So it, the referrals would not come as dermatology or plastic surgery. Dermatology took on the role for teletriage for both the departments and that ensured that all patients came with if or referrals came with images and the patients were then placed into the appropriate service depending on the referral and the image and the, the lesion and where it was. Uh, and that immediately ironed out uh, the, the problem. Um, the same happened with maxillofacial. A large number of uh, Mac MaxFax referrals now come to, to dermatology, which then get rerouted to maxillofacial surgery if needed. And that allows demand capacity to be maintained across the trust and not just benefiting your own department. Uh, the challenges still continue uh, with COVID is the quality of images because you can imagine the whole process will fall in its face if the referrals, large number of referrals are coming without images or they are coming with poor quality images. Uh, so every week we uh, give a list of the poor quality images or no images to our managers who then flag it up with the CCG leads and individual GP practices. So hopefully as time goes along, we will see a huge improvement. Um, th from the trust point of view, the challenge was how do we improve implement this pathway because if we are looking at um, 150, sometimes 200 referrals coming every week, the clinicians needed time to action these referrals and to action them in a timely manner. Uh, with a lot of trust I spoke to, their clinicians were doing it as ad hoc clinics with extra payments. They were doing it out of hours on a weekend during their holidays, but that doesn't allow continuity of care. It does not allow you to action the referrals in a timely manner. And you are then depending on an individual um, who is keen to do the work to do this work. Uh, so we wanted engagement in the whole department and thankfully uh, my colleagues were very keen to take this on. We had to job plan every clinician to allow each clinician a whole week to do this work. So you had the on-call clinician whose clinics had to be cancelled or stepped down uh, for the whole week in order to allow them to do that. And at that point in time, it meant that for the first three months, uh, the trust had to take on a huge risk where all the cancelled clinics had to uh, be done by a locum. So they had to invest hugely in locums to come and cover the work that was cancelled. But within three months, we saw the benefits of this process that the number of referrals dropped. We were needing less and less ad hoc clinics uh, and then uh, uh, the, the cancelled patients were initially seen by locums were then handed back to the substantive team uh, to, to be seen eventually in clinic. Uh, so it was a win-win for everybody. So thankful to the trust for taking this on as well and allowing us to pro proceed with the project and supporting us through this. Uh, so I'll hand over to Dan. Uh, can I get the next slide please? <clears throat> So just want to run through here um, what the impact of that was. So the, the, the left hand, hand side of this chart will be comparable to what was on the, the chart I showed earlier in the presentation, just looking at our weekly demand. This is an annotated statistical process control chart, just looking at what the, the actual impact of that change was. So uh, as, as Manisha has said, that the change point in came in at the, the beginning of March last year. You'll see uh, in that black line running through the middle of the chart is the average of fails per week, not factoring in any any seasonality. That step change that happens in uh, half, roughly halfway through that chart, that's when teledermatology came in. That was the size of that impact. We went from 145 per week to 97 per week in that period. We still have the seasonality of the summers. Those peaks you'll see, there are three peaks in there. That's still the summer coming in, summer 18, summer 19, summer 20. That uh, is unaffected. Uh, the shape of that curve has not changed, but that stepping down has has released those 48 on average referrals per week of patients no longer requiring a clinic appointment and all the associated infrastructure that goes with that. A point of note in there, there is another step down and a step back up again that corresponds with the earlier part of 2020. This is a phenomenon uh, that is only explained by COVID. You'll see that we had record low numbers, even lower than the traditionally quiet uh, into Christmas New Year week, uh, where patients have presumably uh, declined to go and, and consult their GP uh, about concerns around, around skin lesions. The evidence has suggested that 
these patients have potentially not returned into the service uh, as yet. We are waiting to see what will happen. As I as said uh, earlier, that, that summer tends to run into summer runs into early October. This is perhaps run a week or so later this year. But um, uh, other than that, we we are my analysis suggests that um, we are getting back the patients we expect in, in the same sorts of arms at uh, a non coincidental 97 per week again. Um, so this has been as a really impactful in uh, in our demand numbers. If we could just get the next slide as well, please. So this is just comparing those performance again. So the, again, the left hand side of both charts is where we were before. I've picked out uh, the middle section just as a uh, the. Uh, <laughs> The teledome coming in seems to coincide with the drop in performance. This I just wanted to explain that this is um, an independent change. This was more to do with uh, our capacities and the demand side. So we did experience a, a turbulent period where we didn't have as many substantive doctors as we needed for the work we're doing. As Manisha suggested, we were rearranging job plans and we, ha we had independent sector colleagues coming in and joining us to, to deal with some of that. So we've gone through that process. We've done the hard work. We've broken the back of that and what, uh, an another change we made to skin cancer was at the uh, end of March, beginning of April, we've reorganised the services to have rapid access uh, clinics on a Monday, Tuesday with a see and treat style operating for where possible for, for the patients. So uh, the, the recognition of that in performance is our skin cancer performance is I'm led to believe the best in the in the region and if not the best in the country. We've been successfully hitting um, all of the, the cancer standards uh, month on month on month throughout probably the, the toughest hospital experience any of us have ever faced in our careers. So uh, and we're incredibly proud of this and it's, it's down to the hard work of everybody involved in this um, that we have been able to do this. So my expectation is that going into uh, out of this this financial year into the new financial year we'll continue to hit those highs and we will have a much more stable uh, model that allows us to deliver all of this extra and, uh, and change of work that the doctors and, and the nurses have been asked to do uh, around uh, outpatient appointments and on the surgical side of it and we will we will keep managing all of these cancer standards uh, month in month out is, is, is our expectation and I'll just hand back to Manisha for the final part. Uh, right, so uh, the next slide please which is the one impact on patient experience. Uh, so you can see the pie chart where um, uh, in the whole 100% of referrals, the red bit indicates the patients who have a two week wait appointment in dermatology. So you can see that we have we are now only seeing 56% of the referrals uh, compared to what the 100% referrals we were seeing earlier. Uh, so this is the impact of teledermatology. So the number of referrals we now need to see is only 56% of uh, compared to what it was previously. A proportion of them are getting directed to plastic surgery. Uh, that is 14%. 10% uh, are getting rebooked as routine appointments. Uh, our rejection rate still remains 13%, although it varies week on week. Uh, and the rejection rate initially was 30%. This was pre-COVID. Post COVID, we have seen that a lot of GP practices are not bringing in the elderly vulnerable patients to get photos taken. So a lot of the photographs that were initially sent to us during and immediately post COVID uh, were patients own photographs, which patients were taking in their own home with their own phone. So the quality of photographs wasn't great, and that is why it has dropped back down to 13%, but it's still uh, comparable to the national average. But hopefully that once uh, the GP start doing the photographs in their practices um, and the photographs are of a better quality, then we can move that figure back up to 30%. Um, but we are seeing only 56%. The rest are all either downgraded, discharged or redirected into appropriate services like MaxFax or plastics. From a patient point of view, it is a, a huge relief for patients to uh, get letters within two, three days of their GP sending in a photograph uh, to say that the lesion is benign. So it's a huge relief for these patients to know that the lesion is benign. They're not having to wait for two weeks to be seen in clinic and then told that the lesion is benign. 
It also provides guidance to GPs. Uh, say if we are seeing a precancerous lesion or actinic keratosis, uh, which we are rejecting, we are giving advice on management to the GP so that going forward, uh, the GPs get better at diagnosing it because they've got a photographic evidence. Uh, so if they look at a similar lesion in the future, they will be more confident in making that diagnosis of a precancerous lesion or actinic keratosis and treating it themselves. So fingers crossed, we will see less of the benign lesion referrals uh, in the future as this service embeds in. Uh, also removing any inappropriate referrals means that your waiting time for surgery drops. Uh, so you're seeing the routine referrals like lesions like basal cell carcinomas or the atyp which are not being seen normally in the two week wait pathway. These patients are seen sooner, therefore they have a better access to surgery and a quicker access to surgery. Earlier, all our time was taken up by doing extra clinics to mop up the two week wait referrals uh, where the demand had exceeded the capacity and we were doing week on week extra clinics uh, for this. But now we are able to focus more on the routine referrals. So indirectly the waiting time for routine referrals has gone down and hopefully going forward it will go down as time goes along. So it is a win win from the patient point of view. Um, during COVID, um, although the referrals in initially in the beginning of March with the lockdown, uh, the number of referrals dropped drastically because patients could not access their GP surgeries, but it has allowed a lot of patients to send in their own photos initially, um, even during the lockdown, uh, where if the photos were of a reasonable quality, we were able to reassure and discharge these patients. So it is quite possible that uh, you know th these patients are then not going to wait for weeks and weeks to then see the GP to get re referred back in. Um, so we were able to provide that advice uh, quite quickly. So moving on to the next slide. So from the clinician experience, it has been a win win in the department. Um, Everybody is very happy with the service. There was reduced need for extra clinics, ad hoc clinics. There were cancer patients were often overbooked onto a already overbooked clinic because the breach dates were approaching. Uh, so we, we had large clinics that we were unable to manage and that has helped us. It has given us a better. It has allowed us to give better care to our patients. So doctors are more satisfied. The pathways are more streamlined. So you're having less of interdepartmental referrals uh, so that the larger lesions who need plastic surgery input are directed to plastic surgeons at source. So it follows the trust policy of the right person seeing the right patient at the right time. Um, moving on um, to the last slide. Uh, no, if you move on to the next slide, yeah. Um, so the last slide is looking at the future of uh, this service. Um, so what happened during COVID uh, was something quite unique. Uh, is we were trying to run a two week wait service, which we used to run pre COVID, which was a rapid access one stop clinic where patients came in. They had surgery the same day and went home and that was an incredibly successful service, but we were unable to uh, see all the two week wait referrals uh, in, in that one clinic. So patients, there were two week wait referrals across all the general and routine clinics as well who were scattered about. Uh, with COVID, we had we developed good relations with our plastic surgeons and we decided to run a single uh, two week wait clinic between the two specialties in a COVID resilient department, uh, which would allow both departments to see the their two week wait referrals. And as the numbers were quite small initially, we were able to do this very su successfully. But as the numbers increased, we found that this was an amazing way to work. So we have actually set up dedicated two week wait uh, clinics at Durham uh, as a single hub where all the two week wait referrals are brought into these combined clinics with dermatology and plastic surgeons uh, over two days. So we see all the two week wait clinics in these patients in these dedicated clinics. Patients have their surgery the same day. We have had amazing responses from patients, a lot of compliments that they're very happy with the model of care uh, and we um, want to continue this model going forward. It has developed the two departments very well. There's a lot of teaching, training opportunities, audit opportunities um, and it's endless really. So um, this model will therefore continue. 
Now, where is the future of uh, teledermatology? I think we do need to get a formal patient feedback uh, to see um, how patients feel about this service, uh, which we will probably do once uh, sometime next year, once this initial COVID is over. Um, the ability to use the same technology for advice and guidance, which a lot of GP colleagues have done on their own accord. Our advice and guidance referrals went up from 20 per week to 200 per week during COVID. And it allowed us to give uh, advice to uh, GPs to manage their patients in primary care. These were patients with rashes or lesions that did not merit a two week wait referral. So we did see this huge rise in advice and guidance, which is rightly so. We are looking at models where patients could be put directly on a surgical path where if you see an image that is bond or uh, a lesion that needs to be removed, then why bring the patient into a clinic appointment? If the patient is otherwise fit and well healthy young adult, then the patient could go straight on to a surgical list. So we are looking at developing that pathway forward. Um, we're looking in the future maybe to look at teletriaging for routine referrals where you might want to identify based on the photos patients with the most severe rashes who would need the sooner clinic appointment compared to patients who have mild rashes where they may they could potentially wait. So that way you can target the patients with the severe inflammatory conditions early and see them early to sort them out early. It could be a tool used for specialist nurses running uh, specific clinics, say for psoriasis, eczema, pediatric eczema, where uh, the GPs could refer pictures or their children who are under follow up to the specialist nurses who could then give advice on ERS based on the images received. So that might be another model going forward. There might be a model going forward looking between trusts that say uh, with neighboring trust, if we have specialist clinics running in a neighboring hospital, you could use this model to upload photographs and to upload patient information uh, for a tertiary clinic specialists to then give advice on how to manage these patients in secondary care. So it allows uh, a tertiary clinic to then manage their referrals in a better way. It's also a great tool for audit education. Once you have images, uh, you could use them for teaching your trainees. You could audit. We do a regular three monthly audit looking at all the rejections we have had over the last three months and looking at every 10th patient and then get all our trainees in the room together. We show them the images and tell, ask them what they would do with that image. So it allows them to get trained in teledermatology as well. So it's a great teaching and training tool for both primary care and secondary care. So I think I'll end there and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, you so much. Dan. That's been absolutely brilliant and really interesting to hear. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just starting that conversation about the potential and the future of teledermatology is really interesting. Um, what we'll do is if, if we'll we'll hand over to um, Ben Frankel, who's a, a GP in Northumberland and working with the Newcastle team to hear about their approach as well to teledermatology. Um, we're taking questions in the chat box, so if anybody wants to add anything in there and then we'll, we'll come back with the questions um, and a bit of a discussion session um, towards the end of the, um, the, the meeting. Thanks. Thanks again, Manisha and Dan. I'll hand over to Ben. So I'm a GP in Hexham uh, and I'm also I work for the CCG and uh, for Northumberland CCG and we uh, uh, wanted to, to to develop this a few years ago but we've only we're much we're, we're a good sort of year 18 months behind Durham uh, so so my talks more about the setup and the hurdles that we've had to go through in our area next slide please so uh, the uh, hopefully you can see the next slide. The background to this to this project really started a couple of years ago uh, when we recognised that dermatology referrals were increasing seven percent every year, and everyone was being snowed under with with workload at the hospital, uh, and that uh, whilst they were extremely efficient clinics being run by Newcastle hospitals. Uh, they, uh, th there was a large percentage that were being sent home without anything needing doing. Quite equivalent to Durham's comments about 10%. That's the kind of thing we were seeing uh, um, in Northumberland. And like, like the Durham area, we're a hugely rural area. We've got a large portion of patients having to travel more than an hour. 
so quite similar to um, to Durham in that in that sense. Um, uh, and so we we tried to do a pilot, but because we didn't change the two week wait pathway at all during that pilot, everyone just stuck with what they knew uh, and wanted to just carry on doing their normal work. And and so the the pilot really didn't have the teeth to to make people change behaviour. Um, so we did a survey, we kind of understood why that pilot didn't work and we restarted discussions late last year to try and get the service up and moving again and then COVID hit and suddenly there was a massive impetus behind Newcastle Hospital needing to redesign their service because of social distancing and alongside that I was in talks with uh, um, how we could get photo sharing slicker because that was one of the things that was learnt about from the pilot that the photo sharing wasn't a very slick process uh, and GPs were becoming increasingly confident doing remote consulting at the time and using AccuRx which is the commonest software package we're using in our area uh, to, um, to photo share with patients anyway so there was a, a shift to understanding uh, using digital dermatology in primary care already and we just needed to expand that into into secondary care so that that's the background next slide please so the uh, so really the, the the starting process was was the concept that was agreed between myself working alongside dermatologists and my CCG uh, to try and say, well, let's try and get copy Durham, copy Leeds, uh, and get some uh, proper photographic equipment into into surgeries so that they can properly use it, and then use some software package to get the photo into the clinical records, onto ERS, and and then into specialist dermatology clinics. So the we secured some funding initially in Northumberland. Uh, and we then patted ourselves on the back and said, well, we want to be braver than this. Let's try and get Newcastle, Gateshead CCG, North Tyneside CCG on board. And we got them to also try and get some funding, which they managed to. And suddenly we had enough funding to buy an iPhone SE second generation, uh, a dermatoscope, which we um, properly audited before we purchased. To make sure it would work. We audited the, the pattern that we wanted to get, of the way we wanted to get the uh, photo into the clinical notes and then we developed our pathway from that. Um, so next slide please. Uh, so the, what we tried to do was make the AccuRx that the GPs were currently comfortable with uh, be the platform that they use to get the photo into the clinical system uh, and I really hope that this proves to be really easy and intuitive for GPs because we all know how uh, busy and uh, time pressured everyone's become uh, and being able to do that slickly was really crucial. So what we've got is a system where the AccuRx software is able to send a text message to the practice phone and there's one phone and one dermatoscope in every practice site now in Northumberland, North Tyneside, Gateshead and North uh, Newcastle. Uh, and so we, I think we bought about 170 odd bits of kit at, uh, I can't remember, someone's mentioning there about uh, cost about you know 650 quid or so each so it's a lot of investment into the hardware uh, the uh, digital clinic has been set up and goes live today uh, it was due to go live last week but there's been a glitch uh, but it goes live today all the kit arrived and we had training packages of how to use the kit that's been done over the last few weeks um, there's comms that have gone out in the last few days learning from those training packages uh, to answer some FAQs that have arisen about cleaning the equipment, using the equipment, 
uh, processing the referrals, that kind of thing. Uh, so essentially, if you want to know how, how it actually works in practice, the uh, GP sees a speaks to a patient on the phone usually, maybe sees a photo on the on the phone, says, oh, that not sure about that one, brings them in to examine that skin lesion, then sends a text message to the practice hard phone and damascoscope that's attached to it. That then gets uh, receives that text message, it's opened up, the link is pressed, the photos are taken, both with and without the dermatoscope, and then they're sent back into the clinical system, loaded into the clinical record, a bit like when you see a patient sends a photo to you uh, as a GP. Okay. Uh, we've collected data on the baseline data, and we're going to be repeating that, obviously, in a few months' time now that the service is live. Next slide, please. Um, so, initially, quite a bit like Durham, there was a bit of resistance amongst certain colleagues at the dermatology department because, of course, they're having to change their work patterns, their job patterns, how even their contracts. And so, you know, it's a it's a tough ask for them to change. There was a bit of struggle with GPs being asked to do what is essentially extra work to what they normally would do for a dermatology referral. And the LMC made some good points about that. Um, we've uh, managed to drive this through because essentially we've had quite good clinical agreement between myself uh, and the dermatologists. And we've, we've seen the long-term benefits, a bit like Durham. We can see where we need to get to. It's just about how you get there. Um, I think dermatology is unique in that it, it can offer really strong uh, safety in triaging a photo if, it's, if the photo is of good quality. And I think that's unique about dermatology. You know, not many other specialties can offer that level of accuracy through a photo image. Um, ENT are going to try it. Ophthalmology are probably going to come on board as well. Uh, but the dermatology, I think, by far and away is is the best example. Um, we managed to make sure that we use existing technology, and that existing technology has been boosted by COVID. Uh, no, no questions. It, it's helped to familiarise people with photo sharing and remote working. Uh, I think we still have a big problem with resourcing. We are asking GPs to do extra work, and there has been kickback. And we have had to make this service voluntary or optional to begin with, uh, because we didn't want uh, to get into a big contracting negotiation. We wanted to get the service up and running and, and grab the, the opportunity and the momentum that we had built uh, to, to get it up and running. We are fully aware that we need to think about resourcing and make sure that it's that the resource for dermatology across the whole system is fair and that it doesn't just get sucked up by one department doing all the work. Uh, we've had to do some crucial comms uh, and we've had to adapt that. Like I said, we've done an FAQs document after the initial round of comms. Uh, the uh, the logistics of getting 170 odd iPhones set up, uh, ready for practices to use, sending them out, um, making sure everyone knows how to use them and uh, secure, making sure the that asset that has been bought by all those CCGs is safe and secure is not insignificant. I mean, there's a there's a lot of work behind the scenes to just make sure those assets are are secure, they're safe and they're going to be updatable. And that's why we went for a modern phone uh, so that it's future-proofing this service uh, for updates, other apps, other uses. Um, so going into the future, um, next slide, please. Uh, we are, are fully aware that we need to follow Durham and, and make a, a skin lesion triage center. For, uh, um, for Newcastle hospitals and, and for them to have uh, take all skin lesions, put it through this service and then feed it out to their various clinics that are needed. 
including other trusts. So, for example, Northumberland have a separate plastic service. They take separate clinics, and at the moment, they do get fed patients, but we need to formalise that. Newcastle need to do it with their own plastics. The SCC, the BCC clinics all need to be in on this. But we've started with probably the hardest nut, which is the melanoma uh, to eat weight, because we recognise that if you get that one right with the highest risk patients, you can then feed in the, the, the other um, patient pathways into that uh, once we've got that right. Um, so we need to follow suit with Durham and make sure that all those other services are linked in and that patient referrals get diverted as appropriate without anyone having to be seen twice. It just goes direct to the place that needs them. Uh, we need to carry on analysing data. Uh, we're having regular virtual meetings with the, new, with the trust and the three CCGs that are involved to make sure we troubleshoot as much as we can. And I think uh, following on from what Darren said, you, you know, we hope that GP education follows from this, that GPs learn, they get direct feedback from their, from their skin lesion, that they took a photo and some ownership of that photo uh, to say, okay, now I see that that was a benign lesion, I don't need to take, refer those kind of lesions again. Um, and I also hope that practices might use those photos for inter-practice referral management. Uh, so they might say, okay, well, actually, we've got a junior member of staff there or a medical student or a registrar taking, thinking that, photo, that skin lesion is dodgy. Let's pass it through some of the more senior clinicians to check before we refer. So I'm hoping it will facilitate that kind of thing. So that's me done, really. Any questions? Thank you, Ben. That's that's great, and and I think um, you know just seeing how the um, the development matches up with where Durham are now, as you say that that you know be able to see the future a little bit and and do some of the the, the planning that. Um, that Durham are moving towards as well. Um, it would be great to see the, the evolution of this for um, for the Newcastle uh, team uh, across across the North ICP. Um, one of the reasons for doing this session was to um, to support sort of other areas that might be thinking about the same um, implementing teledermatology as well. And I can see in the in the questions as a um, interest from Tees Valley and I think Cumbria have been interested as well so you know I think this is one of the opportunities for us to share um, share learning and um, and experience as well um, and thank you to Dan for offering to do that for, for Tees. The thing I took out from that was um, engagement planning and um, and a bit of agility as well in the development were, were very key. Any other top tips from, um, from Manisha or Dan around um, getting set up with a teledermatology service? Um, I think the top tip is commitment and there has to be a commitment from all parties. Um, and we were fortunate that we had that level of commitment from not just secondary care, from CCGs, from the network. Uh, so it, we, we were fortunate, I must say, with that. Uh, and that commitment needs to continue to keep looking at your work, to look at the data analysis, look where the problems are. Um, we also want to make sure that it is a safe service because you can imagine traditionally dermatologists all want to see their patients face to face. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not missing anything. Uh, and it was quite a task to convince uh, your traditional dermatologist to then accept this new way of working. Uh, so we have got to make sure that the service is safe. Um, and in order to prove that the service is safe, we started doing this three monthly audit. So, so that no patient and to look at concordance between the reporting dermatologists. So there will always be a group of people who say, who will bring every patient into clinic and there will be that uh, at the other end of the spectrum. You may have a dermatologist who is discharging patients quite easily uh, and you want to get a fine balance of that because on one hand you don't want to bring every benign lesion into clinic uh, and on the other hand you don't want to be discharging those slightly odd presentations of skin cancers uh, which is why every um, rejected referral is looked at by a whole panel in the entire department and everybody individually reports on the image and then we have a show of hands as to how many would reject that referral how many would accept it and then if there's any discrepancy, 
Um, and the, the person who had originally reported on that rejection, their name is kept anonymous. Uh, so if we find that there's a discrepancy that half the department would have accepted the referral, then we bring that patient actually into a clinic appointment uh, in order to see that patient face to face and get reassured that it was benign and not inappropriately rejected. And um, the, from the initial two audits that we did three monthly, uh, we have almost a 93% and a 98% concordance uh, between the reporting dermatologists. So it's a very high concordance rate actually. Thank you, Manisha. I think that's really helpful for, for GPs to understand that level of quality control and, and um, review and audit that's happening at the moment. That That's really great. Thank you. I think we've probably covered the next point a little bit already with, with from Manisha and from, from Ben about how the how teledermatology could be used for the non two week weight referrals as well. And there's obviously a lot of potential there for that as well. Um, one of the things we're interested in from a, a the Northern Cancer Alliance point of view is the, um, the rapid diagnostic pathways that are being developed and really from what I've heard I, you know I think teledermatology brings the skin pathway very close to being a, a rapid diagnostic pathway to meet these sort of criteria around early identification, timely referral, assessment of symptoms, the coordinated testing um, and then timely diagnosis. Um, so I, I think that's something that, you know, actually we, we can go to Durham and, and hopefully to Newcastle soon and be able to say, you know, we, we can describe this as an RDC. The other um, hot topic is community diagnostic hubs. Um, and my question was going to be around the quality of referrals and so the quality of images and whether that should still be maintained in um, general practice or whether there's a role for moving the images out of general practice and into, for instance, a community diagnostic hub. Um, ben, any any thoughts about that from your point of view or, or is it too early to tell? I, um, I have spoken to some departments that do what you're proposing. Um, in London, they have a model where a GP uh, simply identifies a lesion for a two week wait referral. The patient then goes into a photography service where the photo is taken and then uploaded. So that assures you that the photo is going to be of a good quality because it's a professional medical photographer then taking the photo. So you don't have this problem with dark images or blurred images or poor quality images uh, because it's a medical photographer taking the picture. Uh, but the downside of it is that uh, patients can be forgetful. Some patients have multiple lesions on their back or sites where they can't see. Uh, they might have gone to the GP. The GP may have identified a lesion to photograph, but the patient goes to the photographers and gets another lesion photograph. So you can have the wrong lesions getting referred by mistake. Um, also, the fact is that uh, patient, the patient may have gone to the GP with a lesion on the scalp, but uh, they might have another mole on their neck that is catching and they might tell the photographer of that mole and the photographer might photograph the mole on the neck instead of the mole on the scalp. Uh, so there is often this problem where the wrong lesion can get photographed when you have a third party doing your foot photographs for you. That's really interesting. Thank you. I think that's a really helpful perspective to have. Um, but it is an option yeah, if you can I... get same day photographs. If a GP mm -hmm. marks the lesion and before the mark gets washed off, if the photograph is taken, then that helps. Uh, but that's going to be very difficult to implement in a community setting. OK, we only have a couple of minutes left um, here and I just wanted to say thank you again to um, to everybody for contributing to this um, to this session. And um, I think we, we Peter, can we, I just mention one thing? Yeah, sure, Ben. Sorry, just a, a, in response to uh, I think Helen said they're currently implementing a pilot in Tees Valley uh, on the on the chat. Uh, it was it was just commenting on on pilot as, as a rule for this service. I think pilots are really good, but it was just to say that I'm not sure that they really work very well because doctor behaviour really uh, and clinician behaviour really goes for what they know, and and so they, they so they'll gravitate towards their their usual habits, and pilots are really hard because they know that they're temporary, they know that they're not uh, a a kind of a, a complete buy-in. Uh, and, I, and I just 
worry about making a decision based on a pilot. You can you can do some things with a pilot. You can prove a concept with a few people. But I think what we learned was go go full on, go 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 big and go go you know and try and get that that broader commitment. Uh, thanks, that thanks, I think I think you know these are the kind of things that sharing with our colleagues across the region as they're developing the services is really useful. Um, uh, another comment for anybody who hasn't got visible can't see the chat box is about um, dental just wanting to feel the lesions as well as see them and Dan's responded to that to, to, to say yes that you know but in general people are brought in if there's any concern at all and uh, about needing to examine a, a lesion in more detail. Um, and there's a question as well about the um, th about the patient feedback, but I think again we've already responded to that, that that there's more formal feedback, patient feedback plan for Durham, and hopefully that's being built into the to the Newcastle pilot as well. So I think I just you know wrap that up by saying thank you again to um, Manisha and Dan, and also to Ben for for contributing, and to our NCA team for supporting the um, the meeting. And thanks very much everybody for joining us. Thank you.